Hello and welcome to the Berean Voice. I'm Randy Seaver. We're continuing to talk about the subject of authentic evangelism and its counterfeit. I'd like to talk to you just for a moment about the book that I wrote by that title. Uh, if you have the book already and have read it, then you know that I'm not um, giving you in this series all of the material that I, I've given in the book. And for that reason, I'd like for you to have the book. I'd like for you to buy it and read it and and um, and meditate on everything that I've had to say there. I think it's important material, not because I wrote it, but because um, it's simply gospel truth. Uh, we, we need, I believe, in our day to recover the gospel. Uh, there are so many who are preaching uh, a counterfeit product. And the counterfeit product will never produce what the gospel was intended to produce. If you can't do anything else, uh, I would invite you to go and read J.I. Packer's Introduction to the Death of Death and the Death of Christ. You can find that online free of charge. And um, I'd like you to read that and reread it and meditate on it. But I'd also like you to read, read the book that I wrote. If you sincerely can't afford the book, let me know. I'll send you a copy of it by email. Um, but, but please, get the book. Um, I'm giving a great deal more detail in the book than I, I can give you here in these these short videos. But I want to try to give you some, some taste for what I've had to say there. Uh, I think it's important that we begin to confront these issues and ask the, the important questions. What, what, about, what about what was preached in the book of Acts? How, how does the message we hear in the average evangelical pulpit today compare to that message? Is it the same? And if it isn't the same, why are we preaching what we are preaching and not what they preached? Uh, a couple of questions I'd like to deal with in this particular video. The first has to do with the free offer of the gospel, or if you will, the well-meant offer of the gospel. I have a, a number of friends who um, would call themselves Calvinist, and um, they have disagreed with me over this issue of, of a free offer of the gospel. I would probably be in the tradition of uh, William Carey, um, Andrew Fuller, some of those early missionaries who uh, went to carry the gospel to foreign lands, although they were known as Calvinist. Um, you know, I, I, I found myself deeply troubled by what's happening in the Christian community over this issue of Calvinism. Uh, if someone asks me uh, if I'm a Calvinist and I have some sense that they have a clue what they're talking about, I will say yes, I believe in, in Calvinism as it is set forth in the Canons of Dort and in the Westminster Confession of Faith. I have no affinity toward what most people on YouTube and in, on Facebook think Calvinism is. Uh, to, to hear them tell it, we Calvinists ought to have um, horns and a bifurcated tail and wear red flannel underwear because we're of the devil. Uh, we believe that uh, God simply created some people for the purpose of sending them to hell and for no other purpose, and um, that he has made no provision whatsoever for fallen sinners who are not among the elect. Uh, there is no sufficiency in the work of Christ for them. Uh, if they believe the gospel, then they're not going to be saved because Jesus just didn't die for them, so they can believe all they want to. And, 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 then, and then God forces other people against their will, drags them kicking and screaming into the kingdom, and uh, they really don't have any choice. It's like divine rape. Uh, God just makes them do something they don't want to do. And, and this is what people think Calvinists believe. And uh, <laughs> despite all our efforts to say, no, we, we don't believe that at all, they, they go on thinking, yes, you do. Well, that isn't, that isn't what we believe. Um, listen to what Calvin wrote about God's willingness to save sinners. Calvin said, God is infinitely compassion, compassionate and infinitely ready to forgive so that it ought to be ascribed exclusively to our unbelief if we do not obtain pardon from him. Now that's the guy 
that this system of theology has been named after. What a, what a tragedy that we have to be named after a man, but we're stuck with it. Uh, that's the title we have. But listen to what Calvin said again. God is infinitely compassionate and infinitely ready to forgive so that it ought to be ascribed exclusively to our unbelief if we do not obtain pardon from him. And so, and so the question is, if, if we are Calvinist and we believe that God indeed did determine that in, despite sinners' unwillingness to come, he would save a people for himself, he determined that he would enable a, a favored number of sinners to repent. Now keep in mind that, that God is not unjust in, in, in withholding from some blessings which no one deserves. Hear that again. God is not unjust in withholding from some blessings which no one deserves. If God does not bless anyone, then God is just, because God does not owe anyone any blessing, spiritually speaking. God does not owe us anything at all. If God grants anything to us, it is merely by his grace and mercy that he does so. He can justly harden Pharaoh, and, and, and of course Pharaoh has hardened himself as well, but he, Pharaoh has, has hard, hardened himself and hardened himself and hardened himself against the command of God, and finally God says, okay, this, this is it. I'm going to judicially harden you. And God has every right to do that. God has every right to leave Pharaoh to himself and to his own devices. Raise him up that his power might be made known throughout all the earth. And God has every right to manifest his mercy to the people of God called Israel and to Moses, the leader of those people, by showing Moses something of his glory. God has every right to do that. That's what Paul is establishing in Romans chapter 9. People really get hung up on Romans chapter 9 and they say, well, he's not talking about salvation, he's not talking about individuals. Uh, it, but, the, but the whole point is that that really doesn't matter because, because what Paul is establishing in Romans chapter 9 is God's right to do what he will with his own. That's the whole point that Paul's making. And Paul's saying to the Israelites, don't get bent out of shape with me because I'm preaching to the Gentiles. This is what God sent me to do according to his purpose, and God has every right to do that. If God had given you what you deserved, you'd have been lost, just like Esau and Edom were lost. And if God didn't give me and every other believer what we do not deserve, we would have been lost God has no obligation to save. Don't get upset because God has cast off Israel. God has the right to cast off Israel. He, he does so because of their unbelief. God has every right to save his elect people because God is the sovereign potter. Don't, don't think God owes you something. If God owes you anything, it's wrath and curse for eternity, and that's all he owes you. Okay? So I get the idea, well, if God doesn't give me salvation, he's not being fair to me. He's not being just to me. And listen, if God gave you justice, you'd burn in hell. Okay? Don't, don't think you deserve anything from God. What Paul is establishing is God has the right to do what he will with his own. Paul then brings up an objection of the supposed objector. What, what shall we then say to these things? Uh, we, we can learn a great deal from the objections Paul answers and how he answers them. Uh, you will then say to me, why does he yet find fault? How, how then can God hold people responsible if we have simply done what he decreed that we would do, if we have fulfilled his will. And Paul could have answered that question in a number of ways, but Paul's answer to the question is very clear. Who are you, O oh man, to reply against God? Who do you think you are? You piece of broken pottery. You, you don't have any right to, to reply against God. And so God has absolute authority. That's what we mean. We don't mean that God meticulously uh, causes everything he has decreed. 
God doesn't have to meticulously cause everything he has decreed. But he has decreed all that comes to pass. But, but don't, don't get bent out of shape because you think God is making you do something you don't want to do. God, you're doing exactly what you want to do, and you are fulfilling God's purpose in doing what you desire. And so here's the question. If God has determined beforehand that he is going to save a people for himself, and we don't know who those people are, how can we offer the gospel sincerely, universally, as a well-meant offer of the gospel? Just that, that, that whole phraseology to me uh, just sounds smelly. Uh, you know, you, no, God, God's offer is not a well-meant offer for everyone. Well, what are you saying when you say that, my friends? And I'm talking now not to the to the synergist audience among us. I'm talking now to my, my Calvinistic buddies. What, what are you saying when you say God's offer to sinners is not a well-meant offer? Are you saying God is insincere? Are, are you saying that God can't be trusted? Give me a break. No, God's, God's offer of salvation, is, it is a command, there's no question, but God's offer of pardon to everyone who obeys that command is a sincere offer of pardon. If we say that it's anything other than a sincere offer of pardon, then we are saying that God is a big, fat hypocrite. And that simply isn't the case. I want, to, I want to read a passage to you. It's back in the book of Acts, chapter 13. Paul has, according to his custom, gone into the synagogue, and he has begun to open the, the scriptures and show his, his brothers, according to the flesh, that um, Jesus was indeed and is indeed the anointed one of God, as prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures. And he continues... Uh, almost, almost um, preaching the same message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. He, he talks about the promises of God being fulfilled, and that's exceedingly important. God did everything he said he was going to do. Why, why is that important to us? Because, because it, it shows us that God can be trusted. God fulfilled these promises just as he said he would. We can trust him to fulfill his promise in the gospel to pardon every sinner who returns. And so, and so he's, he's in the middle of this, this, this message, and, and he's, he's telling these people of, about this Messiah who's come and, and, and been approved of God, and yet they killed him, but God raised him up. And, and then he says, um, in, in verse, verse 31, he was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people, and we declare to you the glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled for us his children, in that he has raised Jesus from the dead, as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Then he goes on, in verse 36, to say, For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried and his fathers, uh, with his fathers, and saw no corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of of sins, for by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from whom you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now, mind you, he's preaching at this point to a group of unbelieving rebels. He's preaching to a group of unbelieving Jewish people. And he says to them, listen carefully, with no evidence whatsoever that they are chosen by God to spiritual blessing in Christ. He says to them, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, and he means brethren in the, the physical sense, not in the spiritual sense, 
Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, Jesus, is proclaimed to you the forgiveness of sins. Later on, many of these same people came back and and and. Paul says to them, For as much as you have judged yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. In other words, these people, at least at this point, are perceived as non-elect sinners. And yet Paul says to them, Unto you is preached the forgiveness of sins. Now, the forgiveness of sins is not preached to you if you don't repent. You're, God's, God's offer of mercy is not to impenitent sinners. God's offer of mercy is to those who repent and trust his promises. But it is a sincere promise. To whom is, is it to be preached? And the answer is, it is to be preached to every creature under heaven. We, we, we make this gospel promise based on the authority of God himself and the, the, the free and well-meant offer of the gospel is based on the fact that God is faithful. We have the promise of God. But not only that, we Calvinists, if, if, if we want to call ourselves that and, and, and you understand what we're talking about, Please don't call us Calvinists if you, you haven't read the Canons of Dort and the Westminster Confession of Faith and other, other, other historical documents. Don't, don't, don't even think about calling us Calvinists if you think we believe what you think we believe, unless you've read these documents. Shame on you if you have uh, accused us of being demonic and, and cultic and all the rest of that, if you've never even read our doctrines, if you've just taken some yabo's word for it then shame on you. But if we are Calvinists, then we believe not only in the specific, the particular intent of the work of Jesus Christ to secure the eternal salvation for everyone who will ever believe the gospel, namely those who have been given to the Son by the Father. Remember, remember that when Jesus comes before the throne of God at the last day, he will say, Behold, I and the children whom God has given me. That ought to have an impact on you. Behold, I and the children whom God has given me. You see, we not only believe that there was a, a specific intent in the death of Christ, but we also believe there was an abundant sufficiency in the work of Christ for every sinner who will repent. There is no sinner on the face of the earth who wants to be saved, who will not be saved by this sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. The, the sincere offer of the gospel has nothing at all to do with the decree of God. We don't know what the decree of God is. We can't base our offer of the gospel on the decree of God. Whom has God determined he's going to say? I don't know. I didn't get up this morning and ask whether it was the decree of God for me to put on my clothes or to drink my coffee or to take my walk with the dog or any of those other. I didn't ask that question. I don't need to know what the decree of God is. I don't live my life according to the decree of God. And the free offer of the gospel is not based on what we perceive God has decreed. We don't know what God has decreed. The free offer of the gospel is based on what God has declared. And what God has promised to do is to save every single sinner without exception who repents and believes his promise. And that, my dear ones, is a sincere, well-meant offer. And if you can't preach that, then you need to study the scriptures until you learn that you can. Shame on you if you can't. Shame on you. This was the problem when, when the Baptist church, at least, was, was in the grips of, of hyper-Calvinism. Um, and um, Andrew Fuller wrote his wonderful little book, The Gospel Worthy of all acceptation. I, I know I'll probably lose friends by even say that was a wonderful book, but it was. His, his point was, do sinners have a duty to believe the gospel? Do sinners have a duty to believe the gospel? Is the gospel worthy of all acceptation? 
Can we preach to sinners and tell them that if they repent, God will certainly save them? I, the, the book's online. You can read it for free. You don't even have to buy it. It might take some waiting if you're not used to reading that kind of material, but it, it's, a, it's an excellent, excellent book. Um, there is an abundant sufficiency in the work of Christ to save every sinner who will believe. I've often wondered why people get out, of, get bent out of shape it, because they think they can't tell every sinner that Jesus died for them whether they will believe or not. The gospel doesn't tell us Jesus died for every sinner whether he will believe or not. The, the gospel tells us that Jesus died for the guiltiest sinner who will repent and believe. That's the gospel. And that's what we need to be preaching. We need to be preaching there is, a, there is an all-sufficient Savior who once died, but who has risen from the grave, who has been enthroned, who has plenary power to save every repenting sinner, every sinner who has cast down his weapons of warfare and, re and returned to his holy throne. He has promised to pardon Listen, that is the good news of the gospel. That's what we need to be proclaiming to sinners. Come, sinners. Come, come just as you are. Don't try to fix yourselves up. Don't try to make yourselves better. Come just as you are. Spurgeon tells the story of the man who was an artist and he wanted to paint a, uh, a portrait of, of the people in the, in the town where he lived that that uh, depicted something of the history of the town and the culture of the town and what was going on. And so he went down to the, to the slums and he found an old bum lying there in his vomit. And he said, Could you, I'm going to pay you. Can you come to my studio tomorrow because I'd like to put you in my portrait? Well, the next day this man showed up and he had shaven. He, he was dressed nicely. He had bathed himself. And the man said, oh, no. He said, I didn't want you like this. I want you just as you were. And you see, that's, that's really what the gospel tells us, isn't it? It tells us God doesn't want you to come after you've tried to fix yourself up. He wants you to come just as you are. You know, Luke chapter 15 has just suffered greatly at the hands of of uh, synergist theology, uh, th theologians, if, if you can call them theologians, um, because they, they don't seem to understand the meaning of the parable. They want to talk about the ability of the son in the big pen to get up and take himself back to the father. But if you know anything about, about hermeneutics, you know that parables are not intended to walk on all fours. Um, parables are intended to teach one main, one principal lesson. And all of the incidental details may fit in, but they may not. And so we can't interpret parables in terms of all the details of the parable. We have to simply look at, at the focus of the parable. And the question is, what was the focus of the parable? The focus of the parable was not on the son. The focus of the parable was on the father. And, and the occasion for this parable was that, that the scribes and the Pharisees were bent out of shape because Jesus was rece receiving harlots and publicans and sinners, and he was eating with them. They, and they said in derision, this man, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so he spoke a, 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 a three uh, sort of a trilogy of parables. One of them had to do with a, a lost coin, one had to do with a lost sheep, and one had to do with a lost son. But, but the focus of all these parables was not on the, the coin or the sheep or the son. The focus in all these parables was in the one seeking the coin and the, and the, and the son or the sheep and the son. The focus of the parable is on the father and the father's willingness and in this case, in reality, the Father is really representative of, of Jesus himself because he's the one receiving sinners. What good news. Jesus receives sinners and eats with them. And so the whole focus of the parable is not on the ability or inability of the Son or what his lostness meant, means or what his deadness means. No, those, those are just incidental um, uh, trivial matters in the parable. The parable is about the Father. And what does the parable tell us about the Father? The father, the, the parable says, when the son was returning, and when the son 
was yet a great way off. The father saw him and had compassion and ran to where he was and embraced him and kissed him. And he said, my son, and the son starts his little spiel and the father says, just hush, let's go have a party. That's what the parable's about. It's the parable's about the willingness of the, of the father to receive the poor, wandering, rebellious sinner. That's the message we have to preach. Is God willing to save sinners? Absolutely. Absolutely. He will turn away no sinner who repents. Well, you say, but they can't repent. But that's not the point. Why can't they repent? Jesus put it this way. He says to the scribes, who should have known the scriptures quite well and did, you are searching the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. But you've missed the message. They are they which testify of me. But you wish not to come to me that you might have life. There's the problem. Will any sinner who wishes to be pardoned and is willing to throw down his weapons of rebellion against God ever be turned away? And the answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. The Father is willing to receive. Well, you say, but he, he must give us the willingness. Yes. But he doesn't owe us that, does he? If he gave us what we deserved, he would leave us all in our rebellion. This is the condemnation, that sin, that light has come into the world. But men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And everyone who does evil, everyone who practices evil, hates the light and doesn't come to the light. You see, if God left us to ourselves, we'd all perish. But if we come, if we come, if, if a sinner should come without the ability God gives, will God receive him? If, if a sinner should come whom God has not chosen to save, will, will, God, will God save him? Think about that Syrophoenician woman. Jesus said to her, I'm sorry, I can't do anything for you. I'm only sent to the elect. I'm only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I, I'm not going to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. And she said, yea, Lord. Yea, Lord, but the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. That's, that's the message we have to preach. You don't preach to sinners as elect sinners. You, you preach to sinners as miserable, miserable, broken, foul, vile, rebels against God. And you say to them, if you'll throw down your weapons, God will receive you with open arms. I'll bet, dear ones, that, that's the good news of the gospel. That's what we need to be preaching to poor, helpless sinners. Come, you sinners. Jesus, ready, stands to save you, full of pity. Join with power. Well, until next time, may God richly bless you.